Hello, BookTube. It's another grim, gray day here in Boston. Not exactly raining, but damp and inhospitable. And uh, I'm sure it's not connected, but I also got a small mail haul again today. Uh, and I thought I'd open it for you, since <laughs> that makes it more fun for me and more fun for you. Uh, and the one that I'm not opening is the one I open first thing in the morning. I got a book, one book, uh, first thing in the morning, Federal Express, and I thought it was... Uh, deadline book that I've been particularly waiting on so I just tore it open and it isn't I don't know why anybody would send anything FedEx if they weren't priority but this is this is simply a book uh, it's called Claretta Mussolini's Ma Last Mistress by J R J B Bosworth and it's about uh, Clara Pataki who was his his mistress at the end of his life and whose gruesome claim to fame in the popular mind is that she is the woman in that horrifically iconic photo hanging upside down next to Mussolini, their bodies looking like hog carcasses in a butcher window uh, when partisans overtook him and, and murdered them both. Uh, this is... <laughs> I don't know this, this Bosworth author. And I, he could make a gripping story out of this, but this is the type of World War II associated book that is sometimes a bridge too far, even for Steve. And I am the biggest fan of reading about World War II there is. Uh, the life story of Mussolini's last mistress seems like thin gruel with which to make any kind of historically important narrative other than just a biography of her. Uh, and the, on top of that, I know that while I'm reading this, the whole time hovering over it is going to be that photo which, you know, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Uh, so, I don't know. I, it's, it's a brand new book from Yale. It's a, it's a historian I, whose work I don't know. It's a period that I know really well. I hate to just give it a miss. So, I, I, I probably will read it, but I don't know. I, it's, it's an ambiguous start. It was an ambiguous start to the book day. But then we have four packages that we can just open together uh, and see what they are. Watch one of these be the one I was waiting for. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. Uh, this is th This Long Pursuit by Richard Holmes, who's a great Romantic Era uh, biographer of the Romantic Era. That's what the cover looks like. Uh, and this is uh, Reflections of a Romantic Biographer. So this will be little bits and pieces, probably previously published stuff from the New York Review of Books and whatnot. Uh, traveling, teaching, ballooning. <laughs> and then... Uh, and then a bunch of biographical essays. Uh, Thomas Lawrence, a great painter, one of my favorite painters. Uh, William Blake, Shelley, Keats. Uh, Margaret Cavendish. <laughs> a little odd. Uh, so that's fantastic. That That's just fantastic. The, 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 uh, I don't mean to sound ambivalent about it at all. He's a great writer. Uh, and little occasional pieces like this will be fantastic to read. Uh, and this comes out in March... There's plenty of time for me to pitch this and maybe get somebody to give me a checky-poo for writing about it. But otherwise, there's always Open Letters Monthly. Uh, let's see here. What's this next one? I'm a little bit distracted because my Basset Hound is awake and looking at me. She's been a little needy for the last 48 hours. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to wean her off that by not by not, you know, holding her all the time. She is feeling a little better, so I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to just uh, pay attention to her the whole time that I'm doing anything else here. Let me, let me show you. <laughs> She's right there. Her enormous head is right there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's see here. What's this next one? Uh, this is by Joseph Scapolato. It's called Big Lonesome, uh, and he is. A hipster doofus. Uh, let's see here. Reinventing a great American tradition through an absurdist discerning eye, Joseph Scapoletto uses these 25 stories to conjure worlds, themes, and characters who are at once unquestionably familiar and undeniably strange. Big Lonesome navigates through the American West, from the Old West to the Modern Day West to the Midwest, from cowboys to mythical creatures, exploring place, myth, masculinity, 
and what it means to be whole or broken. And naturally, the publicist also mentions he's working in the vein of George Saunders. Uh, and this is his first book. How exciting. Uh, okay, so this comes out in February. Uh, Big Lonesome. <laughs> uh, and then what have we got here? It's this thing. Not, not particularly... No, okay. That's what we have scissors for. The one or two odd packages that just don't want to behave. Uh, so a note to all of you fellow booktubers of mine. Notice that because the scissors were nearby, I did not have to get up, leave the camera staring silently at blank space, rummage around somewhere else for a long time, and then come back. That is called making presumptions on your attention. <laughs> so you notice, because I had scissors nearby, I didn't have to do that. The other option would be that if this package had given me trouble and I didn't have scissors nearby, what I would do would be to edit out the part where I get up and go and look for them. <laughs> but I'm no expert at this. Uh, so what we got here, this is nice and thick. This is due in December. Wow, okay. Um, this is the Princeton Handbook of World Poetics. the size of that thing? don't know that I would be able to pick out a world poetic from a police lineup. What, what, what have we got here? It provides a comprehensive and authoritative survey of the history and practice of poetry in more than 100 major regional, national, and diasporic literatures and language traditions around the world. Drives me nuts. <laughs> Doubling. Speech like that, padding, drives me nuts. <laughs> Literatures and language traditions are the same thing. Can't have one without the other. Don't need to have both. That's right. I'm not, I'm not reviewing the pub sheet for Pete's sake. <laughs> uh, with more than 165 entries, the book combines broad overviews and focused accounts to give extensive coverage of poetic traditions throughout the world. Huh. So this is uh, a textbook of some kind? Oh, God. Oh my, Greek poetry, Hebrew poetry. Oh my, Estonia. <laughs> okay, all right, that's uh, <laughs> that came out of the blue. Uh, and then we'll do the last one here. Okay, we might as well just employ the scissors again. <laughs> so, uh, since this is the exact same company, it looks like it might even be Princeton. So, all right, let's see. What this is. Yes, this is also Princeton. Okay. Scurvy, <laughs> The Disease of Discovery, by Jonathan Lamb. <laughs> oh my, it's a history of scurvy. <laughs> this is also due in uh, December. This is the story of scurvy, a disease whose victims were rendered so acutely sensitive to external world that their skin tingled at the lightest touch, their ears were deafened by the slightest sound, and the scent of a flower could cause agonizing pain. During the 18th century, scurvy's rise presented an impediment to expansionist British naval discovery as it surged outwards into the Pacific Ocean. And yet, at the same time, this burden on colonial growth paralleled other forms of more inward bodily discovery, naming, namely scientific advances in microscopes, telegraphs, and hydroscopes. Isn't that interesting? So it's not just a history of scurvy, though that would be interesting on its own. It's also uh, an angle. It's got an angle. <laughs> uh, and he is the Andrew Mellon Professor of Humanities at Vanderbilt University. And has written many books, including uh, The Evolution of Sympathy in the Long 18th Century. But you know, I remember... Good Lord. That is somebody you want to pay attention to. <laughs> I seem to remember his... Uh, his author bio lists the same thing as the pub sheet. I seem to remember his name from a book that wasn't either of these two that are listed, that I really liked have a list of his works that would be nice princeton but no we don't princeton okay all right well i'll look him up <laughs> uh, i have a feeling that that I, he's done something that i really liked although this could be good uh or I, i've mentioned on this channel before ordinarily i don't like uh potted conceptual histories like this uh, 
cultural history of the color purple, uh, you know, social history of the of the orgasm, the, the diseases, uh, histories of the disease, uh, books that concentrate on one particular calendar year, eighty thousand, eighty fourteen ninety one, that sort of thing. I, I find it often a, a cheap gimmick to make casual browsers on a history table think, "Oh well, history itself." intimidates me but that looks small and handleable i can do that and it's inevitably a lie because you can't write a book on just that you have to once you've hooked the reader you have to then tell a much bigger story a disease history not so much you can't actually just write a history of a disease but uh, uh and that you know that gives is a little bit better disposes me towards this book plus that tease that i know this author's work i'll have to figure that out uh uh so, so this might be the exception that proves the rule. Ordinarily, stuff like this, a history of redheads, a history of Legos, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that is our uh, our haul today. There's uh, This Long Pursuit by Richard Holmes, which is the home run of the thing. It's the thing that I'll read the first. There's a history of scurvy. There's a, uh, the Princeton Handbook of World Poetics. Uh, there's Big Lonesome, a debut novel, always exciting. And a biography of Clara Pataki. Uh, probably the first one in English. Uh, so there you go. That is uh, uh, Overcast Book Hall <laughs> for today. I'll see you soon, Book 2. Thank you.